Uh, my name is Vincent Mann. Um, I'm the Turtle Clan Chief of the Rarapo Lenape Nation. Okay. And we were talking downstairs earlier about what it complicated meaning of what it means to be Lenape, but also Ramapo Lenape. Mm -hmm. Lenape. So perhaps you can kind of help give us a little slice of what that complication is, because part of what's unique and important about Ramapo Lenape is that they stayed mm -hmm. in the area, where so many Lenape were pushed out mm -hmm. and into other parts and had to move multiple times, and Correct. many have ended up in Oklahoma and elsewhere, but the Ramapo Lenape have still stayed here, but it also has been at a price. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so maybe you can tell us about that. Um, <clears throat> at a price, that that is true. Um, I think that, you know, whether whether it is in regards to us or in regards to um, our relatives' ancestors who were, were forced upon that, that walk, um, you know, my way of thinking, it's not that I, I read it, but my way of thinking is that, you know, I don't know that it was so much forced removal and it was a willingness um, as the Lenape people, who we truthfully are in our DNA, that uh, that we our ancestors did that. You know, we were still thinking strategically. You know, um, and for us Ramapo, there's always this misconception that uh, you know when it comes to the federally recognized tribes in this, in, in the United States, that we're trying to steal their heritage and impose it upon ourselves and um, that's emphatically uh, not true um, we have always been who we are uh, we have always known who we are um, you know we, we are not Unami uh, we're Muncie and you know Stockbridge Muncie when we were going through our federal recognition did you know they were supportive of us even to the point where the federal government said um, you know you sent a letter out to them and said you know you can only be recognized in one federally recognized tribe um, to you know the two tribes in Canada you know um, recognizing us you know the language teacher coming from there to come back here you know, to, to bring that language back that has been lost. Um, Can you explain yeah. to somebody who doesn't understand anything why mm -hmm. this debate is so important in terms of NAMI and uh, That's Muncie? The, yeah. yeah, the we are Lenape. What divides us is our language. And I have read some old writings one time and this will probably be the first time it's ever put to a camera, but my understanding is that the oldest, the oldest speaking language in archaic time is Muncie. Now that doesn't fit well, <laughs> and it's not going to when some people uh, watch this at some point. And the reason why that is is because in our culture, the turtle is the oldest part of who we are and if the turtle is the oldest part of who we are and the oldest part of the Algonquin speaking language in archaic time is Muncie then that means that we actually would be considered the turtle um, but then when you throw when you throw in the European way of thinking um, you know, that kind of throws wrenches into things. And I quite often sit and ponder to myself. You know, I'm not a scholar. You know, I'm not educated in college. But I am a spiritual person. And things come to me. And I wouldn't normally be sitting here and going, oh, I wonder about this. You know, but, but that's, that's what happened. And then I start to think about grandfathers and grandparents. You know, weren't the grandparents and you know your grandmother and your grandfather weren't they the ones who protected you right they held you close to you they taught you those things um, you know they also were the peacekeepers right and so as history has played out 
you know, we, the Wolf Clan, the Muncie, as we're known nowadays, you know, we were the Wolf's warlike, you know, uh, warrior is not one of our words, you know, uh, we were protectors, we were defenders, we were peacekeepers, you know, um, and that's an important to know because in the, in the United States, the only federally recognized tribe that's Muncie is the Stockbridge, and, uh, you know, they're not just Muncie's, you know, it's Muncie slash Mohican, you know, uh, almagated, I think that's the correct word, um, and here you have this little band, you know, this little family um, that was able to survive against all odds, losing every, almost everything, you know. There's some things that cannot be taken from you, and I'm sure that you understand what I mean. And, uh, you know, I, I think that it becomes a shell game. And for the Ramapo Lunape, which is, might as well say, Ramapo Muncie. Um, it has been always a struggle. Um, we have always fought to protect this. You know, we, whether that was to be on the side of the British or, the, you know, or the side of the French or, or, who, or the side of the Dutch, you know, we were destined to be here today all those years later. You know, our ancestors forced foresaw that this day would be here when, whether it was me or someone else would be sitting here having this conversation um, in land that was actually Muncie, um, not Onami. And not that I have an issue myself, but, you know, if, if we we're going to take it and, and put it on the table, you know, the Raritan River was the boundary, you know, which was our traditional area where the Muncie was from there up into New York State and almost over to the Connecticut River. Um, that's a pretty big area, you know. And uh, I mean, there's all these different stories um, out there, like uh, Chicken Warrups, you know, or his other name was Sam Mohawk, and he had he had killed a uh, another chief's uh, son over a girl, and they cast him out. And you know, Chief Katona and the Ramapo were the ones who got him and they kept him captive and then the daughter says oh no I don't want you to kill him I love him right and so you end up with um, a scattercoat um, connection to who we are you know and so for the federal government to say well we don't know which tribe they are come from um, you know that's ludicrous you know um, everybody knows who the Ramapo are that's not a question I think that what happens is that the political side um, that's supposed to work for the people, it's supposed to be a tool for tribes and nations. I think that gets convoluted sometimes and, you know, that power and money becomes um, too much and the people get forgotten, you know. And, uh, you know, it, yes, if another tribe becomes fairly recognized, yes, there's that one batch of money that, that has to come down a little bit for everybody, but the reality of it is, is that money is meant to support your government. And when you get federal recognition, that status uh, makes it so that you have the ability to create businesses so that you do not have to be on the welfare system. And that truthfully is what that's supposed to be. You know, what happens is I believe that those governments and certain people feel like it's an, an entitlement that the government owes them. That entitlement that they owe us is in the treaties. It is not because when you're fairly recognized that they give you this money. You know, it's about how many counties you represent. You know, it's about how many people that you represent in those counties. How many states are you in um, to be able to take care of those people, to get them raised up again, to take care of their health care, their schooling, their housing and jobs. Once you do that, then you are you have create businesses, whether it's manufacturing, whether, whether it's farming, whether it's any of those things, and uh, to then take that money and to put it back into your people to raise them up so they are not a part of the welfare system of the United States government. You know, uh, after you get through that part, it's about grant writing. And those only certain grants are only available for federally recognized tribes. But there are federal grants for state-recognized tribes and a government that doesn't recognize state-recognized tribes. It's, you know, 
you, you can't have that, right? You can't say, well, we're not recognizing you for certain purposes, but then again, you have grants from federal dollars for state-recognized tribes. Then you have the state of New Jersey who wants to say, well, we, we don't have any state rec officially recognized state tribes. Well, I got news for you. This is me, progressive thinking, new age, Ramapo, Lenape, Muncie, indigenous person sitting in Manhattan, right? My thought is this. We have a contract, which is a treaty with the, United, with the state of New Jersey, both the House and the Senate, or the Assembly. It is a concurrent resolution. It means that every year, it just goes like this. No one has to do anything. It doesn't need a signature. In order to remove that, there has to be a vote and a signature. I've got news for you. The state of New Jersey is not going to go to that point, right? Specifically when it pertains to the Ramapo, right? And if you go through history, you know who the Ramapo are. They've always been Lenape. They've always been where they are in the region that they were living in, right? Because we live loosely, right? Uh, Lenape people. And so if the state of New Jersey is going to say to me, you know, as a Turtle Clan chief, that we have no state recognized tribes, and I'm going to tell them that you've created one of the largest frauds and perpetrated it against the United States government, you embezzled money, right? Because we had those Title Five and Seven and whatever, right? You know those kids were in those schools? It was Ramapos who were teaching that, federal dollar. You know, so they can say they don't have that. And as I had said earlier, you know, the, the uh, attorney general for New, for New Jersey, who was he? You know, he went to the federal government, as it pertained to us, and said to the um, Indian Gaming uh, Commission, we don't have a way of recognizing Native Americans in our state. So therefore, because of that statement, the state of New Jersey, and this all these years later, right, the state of New Jersey feels that because of that statement, which was to nobody, no one who makes a decision, um, applies to the tribes that are there. And, you know, I continually ask, because I have people that ask questions to, and I get this, and no one's, no one's going to be messing with the Ramapo. And you have to think why. You really do. You know, it's because we have been able to overcome so much, you know. We're still overcoming it. You know, the pain that comes through and it's starting to rise up right now um, is my pain, but it's because of all that pain. You know, the eugenics, you know, the, the continuation of that. Can you talk specifically about the impact of eugenics on the Ramapo peoples? The impact upon the Ramapo people started in the early 1900s, uh, late 1800s. Uh, the state of New Jersey created a school called the Vineland Training School. It was operated, uh, ran by uh, Henry Goddard. Um, there was also a Cold Spring Laboratory, uh, which Mrs. Harriman and David Davenport and them um, created. and. You know, she kind of funded David Davenport. But there was these field workers, you know, that would go out. Their job was to go out into the mountains and find these indigenous people. And uh, they documented absolutely everything. You know, it was like when uh, Christopher Columbus got on the ship and he had these scribes. Their job was just to record, it, even if it was the most unbelievable thing that a human can do to another human, right? That is what they did. There was no agenda. They wrote down three-quarter, I don't know, they couldn't know it was three-quarter ending, but they'll sit there and say, oh, yep, this is definitely, clearly a Native American. You know, and they went to the next one, and they went to the next one, and it was the same thing over and over and over. They're measuring, taking photographs, Every, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Everything, yeah. you know, the way you looked, um, what you did for work, where you lived, you know, what you made, what you grew, um, you know, so... That eugenics movement as it was going forward, you know, and then obviously we had been introduced to alcohol and all of these things early on. We also were introduced to the concept of land ownership. And earlier, 
when we didn't have that concept, we were still going down there and getting the apples from our apple trees. We were still going down there and getting our corn from where it was, you know, getting our sweet grass or, or our, you know, traditional tobacco, and traditional fishing places and gathering places. And, you know, the Europeans, they knew. They really did. They knew and they agreed. And that's why you have this long spatial time where there was not really conflict. Then what happened? When the reserves came, you know, all of that nice sitting down, hanging out, talking, sharing kind of goes away. And they then try to perpetrate, you know, their will upon us. And, uh, and it happened. And we retreated. You know, we retreated into the Rampo Mountains. And so that form of eugenics, which started in the form of blankets, right, um, that regressively correct that, 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 abso absolutely about. and that that was like the beginning of yeah. eugenics right yeah. um, when they realized I mean I'm sure they didn't realize it right away but then it became a tool that they learned and so then they started to do that right offer that up what they didn't realize was that you know we're not the only ones here and many of them died you know and so as the eugenics movement moves forward and tribes are I mean, tribes, they weren't, they weren't even tribes. I mean, quite frankly, we lived in groups, loose groups of people. And so if this coffee cup was the center family that was the first, then this next family moves to here and the next one moves to here and it's so that the environment, and we, it wouldn't put that burden on it, right? And, and we were that way. And so uh, through the eugenics movement, um, you know, they wanted to know and figure out how to breed out who we were. And even to, they had a magazine called The Breeder or something. I can't remember the full name of it. But they, they talk about this in there, you know. Like they, my grandfathers, they used to take an apple tree and a pear tree and they would splice them together and grow, right? There's still some remnants of that that are around. But that is what they thought about eugenics, that they could take this arm off of here and give me your arm because you are an incredible artist. It doesn't work that way. And when you follow the eugenics through, so in 1923, uh, Margaret Sanger, she was the founder of Planned Parenthood and she was part of this consortium of people. Um, they came up with 18 different ways to deal with the unwanted people of the Ramapo Mountains. Those aren't my words, right? Those are their words, and they're written. That means that they wanted people to know. So I'm going to continue to tell you here. So the number one way out of 18 different ways, the most popular way was by a public lethal gas chamber. And this was in 1923, right? That was the year my grandmother was born. Um, it didn't come to fruition, and I thank the creator for that, because that allowed me to be here today. Um, you know, but what did happen was that they took our people and they created, like our kids. Some kids were taken from their parents and they were given to white farmers who couldn't have kids. And they were like, oh, you know, we're just going to teach them how to be domestic. You know, well, they never left, never to be seen again. You know, the other ones were brought to uh, the village that was created over in Stony, Stony Point. I think it's Leffingworth Village. And so they created this little fake village where it was, you know, Ramapo, Ramapo boys and Ramapo girls and they weren't allowed to, you know, really interact with each other. We weren't allowed to talk in any of language, whether it was Jersey Dutch, which was a combination of Muncie and English and Dutch. Um, we weren't allowed to sing the songs. We weren't allowed to do those things and they kept us separate and they were trying to teach us the finer ways of, uh, you know, washing dishes, folding clothes and, um, our women then went to this doctor, and that doctor who was, you know, checking on them, um, checkups, was actually drawing their anatomy over time. And this doctor then had figured out how to sterilize women. And that was on a Ramapo woman. That, that is, you know, the country founded here, you know, it wasn't in Plymouth, you know. I don't take anything away from that, but what this country became known to be 
is because of this place. And uh, so our women were being sterilized and they didn't know, you know. Um, so then all of that stuff that happens, you know, uh, gets sent out, right? And it becomes eugenics here, it becomes eugenics everywhere. California was big time uh, eugenics. Um, and sterilizations really took off out there. Well, eugenics really took off, the sterilizations took off here too, but it wasn't as publicized, right? Because there was already public outcry about what you're doing to these poor people. Um, and so throughout that time, you know, if you think about it, 1923 public lethal gas chamber. When was the Holocaust? Yeah. Nearly 20 years later. Who was Adolf Hitler's best friend? Henry Ford. Who was given the Distinguished Cross, the highest honor? Henry Ford. You know, who had the life-size painting in their office? Adolf Hitler, of Henry Ford. When the Mawa plant opened up here in uh, 55 or 6, it was the largest automobile manufacturing plant in North America, if not the world. We located the original map from 1710. It's called the William Bond deed. When my cousin um, went to Hackensack to find this, and they said, oh, sure, we'll, uh, we'll show you that map. Well, when they went to the metal filing cabinet, pulled it out and unrolled it in front of him, it was on animal skin, the original 300 and two-year-old 1710 William Bond deed written in Dutch language all on the backside. And we fought to protect that. And the state of New Jersey didn't want to hear it because it was Bergen County property, right? It's county property. But even back then, they had to look at that stuff when they went to build something or you're going to buy property. So the Fords knew that that property you can see where our longhouses were, you know. That's, that was the gathering place of all Lenape, Muncie people would all come and gather, you know. That, that pass over there was the pharaoh through, you know. That was how everybody got back and forth, you know, between here and the Delaware River. Other than that, it was us in the Renfro Mountains. It was fortified. We didn't need palisades, you know. Um, so... The Ford people, they had, they knew what was there, right? And then Ford goes and buys, uh, under the guise of Ringwood Realty, 900 acres of land in Ringwood, New Jersey. They tried to remove 800 residents, Turtle Clan members, from that area. And there was public outcry, and uh, again, right, all these years later, where are you? Where are you going to relocate this community? And what they wanted to do was build. Basically, back then it was like a fifty million dollar um, community. It was self-contained for all the executives and everything. In this Ford Motor Company, so thirty-nine miles outside of New York City, right? And they're hobnob with the stars you know, and then all the power. And uh, when they lost their bid to remove us, it was in 1964, not in 1967, and they commenced almost immediately, it was like within a month or two, they commenced a dumping uh, Ford toxic sludge everywhere. And they were so smart with their eugenics, right? It's genocide. There's no two ways about it. And it's corporate genocide and it's murder. And it's something that is embedded and been that way for a very long time. You know, they would take and dump paint sludge. Most toxic chemicals in there. And then they would bring old uh, alternators, you know, things that were of value. What do you think happened? Right in there. They might as well have shot it in our veins and taken out our blood. Because when you are exposed 
and I don't deny the scientists, no one's told me this, but when you are exposed to such chemicals, when you find when those chemicals find synergy mixed with whatever you have in you, that has the ability to change your DNA structure. And once something gets turned on, then it gets turned on, then it gets turned on, and then it becomes, right? We are the only people living in a federal super fund. We haven't even been offered removal. We haven't been offered a new community. What are we offered? We're offered the ability to stay where we're at. They want to take the chemicals and sludge and push it to the middle and put a recycling center over it to save them money so the taxes don't go up. You know, for 40 years nearly, this has been a federal Superfund site, delisted and relisted. It's the only time it's ever happened in this country again. If we weren't 39 miles outside of New York City, this would never even have happened. But they went back out, uh, Jan Barry from the record and others, and our people had gone back out, and they went right to the places that they EPA said that the paint sludge was, and it was not even touched, and they delisted. You know, when Walter Mugden from the EPA, they, when he delisted it as a Superfund site, he gave us another death sentence, right? Yeah. Because it was okay for us to go back and fish. It was okay for us to go back and grab the wild carrots that were so toxic that the EPA threw them out because they said, well, there's no way that that could be that toxic. It never went back and tested the wild carrots again. You know, the deer, we have video of deer with cancer. You know, where does, where does that come from? You know, so that, that chemicals of the paint sludge that was in the one area that they want to put the recycling center, uh, the O'Connor landfill, when they pulled that, chem when they took that material out of there and sent it to Michigan, they uh, put it through the furnace. And Michigan called and said, stop now, get the people out of there, run, the EPA. They stopped work immediately, the workers left, two weeks goes by and everybody's going, well, what's going on? I wonder what happened. It takes two weeks to tell us that you found one of the most deadliest chemicals known to man dumped on us in the exact area that Ford, through Ringwood Realty, donated basically the land to us to build homes upon, right? How much can you hate someone, yeah. right? This, after going through the furnaces, could not be legally buried anywhere in the continental United States. Mm. We bury nuclear waste here. Mm. It's a fact. This stuff could not legally be buried anywhere in the United States. The EPA and the federal government, apparently Ford may have possibly owned land by the Chippewa, in Canada, but apparently, from my understanding, I'm not sure if it was Clean Arbors, I'm pretty sure, they took that and brought that up to Canada and dumped it next to the Chippewa Reservation up there, and they exhibit the exact same health issues that we have on open ground, you know, and they, so they never went back to finish this cleanup. Everything kind of went, right? When the settlement came, things went, the lawsuit. You know, there's documentation out there where the lawyers come back and say, you guys don't really know just how much these people really hate you. How do you take that as a human being? <laughs> you know? I mean, we can sit there and look at and say, this is what's been done to us. You know? We persevere, right? If it wasn't for these new generations of Turtle Clan or, or Ramapo and Aki, people who are kids that are being born, at the rate that we're losing people, you know, they devastated us. And then you're going to tell us that we don't have the right to sit at the table eye to eye because your interpretation of a law that was written by a Native American who was a former chief of his tribe, a former ombudsman for the EPA, writes that law to protect all Native Americans. And that's his interpretation of it, as he said it to me himself. You know, it's how how does the world change if no one's willing to stand up to make it be? And for me, I have to save my family's lives. If somebody wants to doubt my 
being a Lenape, I don't care. I know who I am. You know, they all know who we are. You know, otherwise, the person running for president of the United States right now wouldn't uh, made an effort back in the day to derail our federal recognition, but which is also a part of that. Eugenics is not just you know uh, the one thing; it's also a paper genocide, right? And he used his green paper, you know, thinking that we would take and be federally recognized and create a casino and make Atlantic City default. Well, we're not federally recognized. Atlantic City is default. Other federally recognized tribes built casinos around the state of New Jersey. There's no benefit to New Jersey. And even if we had gotten the right to give up our sovereignty, as I said earlier, by becoming federally recognized, because it is what it is, right? We were becoming a dependent nation. We're willing to do that, obviously, right? Because it will help us. We will fall under the protection of the United States government. We are not out west. We understand the laws. You know, we know how to work within the system that's been created because we've been here forever. And even if we had gotten our federal recognition, the Donald Trumps of the world, the Torcellis of the world, the seven title insurance companies of the world, they would have realized that even if we had federal recognition does not give you the creator given right to have a casino. Because yeah. you have to have a pact with the state. And the state can say, oh, no, we want a hundred we want ninety nine percent of your earnings. The tribe says, Oh no way. And then that will go like that forever in a day, you know. So the the their You know, their words to uh, prevent this from happening actually did more damage, not just to us, but to the local communities, you know, um, the ones, the communities that surround us that could have benefited, you know, with jobs or new schools or new roads. Or, you know, they don't look at it in that way. You know, they just look at it as in these people that we've tried to kill every single which way and we still can't kill them. There's no way we're going to give them power. What would they do then? You know, um, well, I could tell you what we would do. We would continue on the path that we're on now. What should change? We're trying to prevent this world from, from getting to a point where we can't live here in an existence because Mother Earth does not need you and me. You know, she can heal herself. She will. She has. You know, hey, there's these big animals. <laughs> you know, hey, there's too many people living next to the water. <laughs> you know, she stretches and she, she'll, you know, send those vibrations through the earth and cause us humans grief, you know, and we have to find the understanding in that, that, you know, we have to try to help save each other, you know, and I believe that that is the Lenape way of thinking. We are the people that will pull over and help you with your tire, you know, or feed you. My grandmother's house growing up on Wednesdays, there'd be 20 people there, and we'd be eating two pounds of spaghetti in a yellow Pyrex bowl and hockey puck hamburgers. Would feed us all. You know, there was never a need to want, you know. There was a need to want to get away from the switch <laughs> that she made us go get when we were bad ourselves, right? And there's a lesson in all of that, you know. Uh, but you've just told a very important story that, you know, very few of us have any clue about. So I appreciate that. And I, th we'll I think follow up on this. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think part of it is because they didn't live it. Yeah. And the unfortunate part is we have and we are still living that nightmare, you know, but uh, my hope is that one day that uh, they will get to stand before us, right, and say, now you thought this of us because this is what you thought, but now this is us and we're not going to do what you did to us.